Dear Father, we bow before you with humility. We thank you for another day that you've given us, and uh, we pray that you'll be with us in our study tonight. Help us to learn from your word, and we're thankful for your word, and especially are we thankful for this book of Genesis and book of beginnings and uh, telling of your working in the world and finally in sending Christ as our Savior and as the Messiah. <clears throat> we thank you, Father, for your love in sending him and for his death on the cross. And we pray, Father, that you'll forgive us of our sins and give us strength uh, to serve you faithfully each day. And we pray, Father, that we will grow to appreciate what was done for us uh, more and more each day that we live. And it will be our song uh, throughout eternity. As we are at the end of this year, Father, we, uh, we thank you for the blessings of this year. We know that it's been difficult for many people, and we pray your continued blessings upon them. And we pray, Father, in the coming year that uh, regardless what it holds for us, that we will trust in you, and we will glorify you, and uh, we will praise you. We're thankful for everyone who is here uh, on this call, and we pray for those who will watch later. We pray, Father, above all, that we give you glory and praise. We are longing for the time, Father, when all things will be made new, and there will be no more sickness, and no more death, and no more sorrow, and no more pain. And we will spend eternity with you, praising you. And these things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, we are in the middle of chapter 44. Uh, and we begin our, our Parsha Vayegash, if I'm pronouncing that uh, correctly. And uh, I got the thumbs up from Ben. That's good. So if you remember, we, we sort of ended last week with uh, a, a, a mini, a small little cliffhanger, uh, which uh, as we've seen in the last couple of Parshas, there are a number of times where it's like that Parsha ends with this unresolved conflict. It's like, what's going to happen, right? As any good narrative is, any uh, good point, point, point in, a, uh, in a story, you're not quite sure. And we, we saw uh, the, the servant come and find that Benjamin had the, the goblet, had the cup in his bag, and now they're standing back before uh, Joseph and uh, Judah speaks up. And at the end of 44, he's uh, I was rereading that a little while ago in uh, verse 16. It says, what can we say, my Lord? How can we plead? How can we prove our innocence? God has uncovered the crime of your servants. Mm, crime of your servants. That's a kind of interesting way for him to put it. Uh, but he's going to make an impassioned plea uh, for uh, himself, but primarily for his brothers. And that's where chapter, uh, that's where verse 18 uh, picks up. And uh, I, I think it's worth commenting and talking about a little bit, Ben, be interested in, in your thoughts on, uh, you, out of all the brothers, right, we had it early on in the story of Joseph, uh, we had a few brothers uh, that were part of the story, but at the, from this point forward, it really is about Judah, and Judah is uh, stepping forward, and uh, when all the other brothers may or may not be willing to say anything, and he's taking a big risk, Right. Yeah, I mean, we've seen, you know, probably a vying for leadership among them. Reuben's the firstborn, but he hasn't acted, you know, like a, a leader in this. And Jacob doesn't trust him. And uh, Judah steps forward. And I guess in my mind, the picture is the other brothers are kind of hanging back because when Joseph says, I'm Joseph, then he says, come near to me. But um, Judah, we see him five times in this whole, not to tonight's Parsha, but the whole narrative. Uh, the first time is in chapter 37, where he uh, intervenes and persuades the brothers to sell Joseph to an Ishmaelite caravan. And uh, he thinks he's ridding the brothers of, of bloodshed to get rid of, of Joseph. The second place is, you remember, Everybody remember in chapter 38, we had that situation that's not G-rated. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, Judah and his dealings with his daughter-in-law, Tamar. And um, then at the end of that, he's forced to acknowledge she's right. Uh, I'm not. And 
that, that seems to be growth in Judah because, you know, he could have just, I think we talked about it before, he could have just, you know, she could have disappeared um, and none of that comes up. But he acknowledges that, that she's right. And so it appears to be a change in the following passages show that. The third example is in chapter 43 where um, Judah convinces Jacob to allow Benjamin <clears throat> to go uh, because the man in Egypt is demanding it. And Judah says there, if anything happens to him, then I'll accept the blame forever. And then the fourth one is in our Parsha tonight. And that's in chapter 44, 18 and following. And, he, and this is one of the longest speeches in the book of Genesis. But Judah is willing to offer his own life for the sake of, of Benjamin. Um, and then, so that's four instances. And then the fifth instance, uh, some people say he's apparently rewarded there. And that's in chapter 49 in Jacob's blessing because his Jacob's blessing is withheld from Reuben, Simeon, and Levi, the older sons, and it's given to Judah. And in 49.8, he'll have authority over his brothers. Then from a spiritual standpoint, we all know through what tribe Messiah comes. It's not through the tribe of Reuben, of course, not through Levi, not through Simeon. It's through this tribe of Judah. And so I don't know if it's directly teaching that here, but it's, you know, it's showing Judah stepping up as, as a leader. I mean, it, it, you almost have to ask the question, uh, you know, if it weren't for this, why would Judah be important, right? What would we know about Judah? What would be the significance of the Messiah coming through his lineage if we did not have this recorded for us? Yeah. Well, we could ask on the other hand, why such a, and importance in Joseph in this whole thing <laughs> when Messiah doesn't come through uh, either of Joseph's sons. So speaking of Joseph and uh, Judah together, then right at the very beginning, you know, as Judah is making his plea, you know, he says, please, my Lord, let your servant appeal to my Lord and do not be impatient with your servant. You who are the equal of Pharaoh might say for you who are like Pharaoh, uh, I mean, when I read that, I mean, when I have read that in the past, you know, I look at it and go, okay, he's trying to use some type of diplomatic language. He's trying to acknowledge that, that uh, Joseph here is uh, obviously very powerful and holds the decision making in his hands and that sort of stuff. Uh, but if you follow that Judah is sort of being bold on his, uh, or the others aren't, and he's willing to sort of step out and and, and, and sort of be vulnerable and make the statements he does, we could look at that a little bit differently, right? We could see that he, uh, he maybe is not saying, maybe he's calling, there's more to be in that idea that, hey, you're just like Pharaoh than, hey, you just have a lot of power. I mean, this whole thing's been going on. Joseph, you know, sends them back, puts the money in their sacks, they discover that, and they go back to Egypt, and then, you know, he says, you better, you better bring the younger son, Benjamin, and he brings him, then there's the cup in the sack, I mean, all these different things, and this guy, this leader, you know, he said, I'm a God-fearing man, and maybe Judah, I mean, the evidence is the cup was found in the sack of Benjamin, so you know, how do you argue with that evidence? The evidence is right there. It's like in a court of law, but, but it seems Judah has boldness and he may be about fed up with all this. And so uh, the Midrash interprets this uh, for, I mean, literally it says you are, and he uses the Hebrew prepos preposition cough. Cough means like or as you're like Pharaoh. You're his Pharaoh. And it, and it may be, and probably it is, that he's recognizing you have the power. And so, but the Midrash interprets it as you will be struck with leprosy uh, like Pharaoh for detaining Benjamin. And earlier Pharaoh was struck with illness for detaining Benjamin's great grandmother, Sarah. Or... And that was just one night, and you've kept Benjamin more than one night. 
another Midrash interpretation is, yeah, you're like Pharaoh. You don't keep your promises. I mean, the, the, the Hebrew is, you. Uh, Joseph said, I want to set eyes on Benjamin. And maybe Judah is saying, okay, is this what you call setting eyes on somebody? Arresting them like this? And this is all these, I think, I mean, I think the brothers know, or, or susp- well, they know Benjamin didn't take the cup, so it's trumped up charges. And how do, you tell that to, how do you tell that to the man in charge, right? Maybe, maybe Judah is saying, okay, well, I'm going to tell him. I'm about tired of all this. But uh, and one thing, you know, regardless of any of that's true, the thing is he steps up in place of Benjamin. Right. And we should, we should, folk, we should not overlook uh, that and, and, and gloss over it. We, we should acknowledge that. Yeah, he he was willing to step forward when too many when other people are willing to sit in the back or are not do anything. Uh, he was twenty two years forward. earlier, maybe probably nobody would step forward. Yeah, and we've talked about the trauma in, that obviously went on in, in this family. Uh, when you just recount, I mean, we, we'd spend that, the evening just recounting all the trauma. But you know, if it's been twenty plus years ago and Judas had to live with this and think about it. Uh, it might have affected him in some way positively. Maybe he has grown. Uh, and it would be nice to think that he was able to find some reconciliation, uh, some way to deal with this, and now has has uh, has grown and is willing to step forward. Um, I mean, he's it- had, you know, you know, um, I, I don't know much about it, but people say, you know, if you have different uh, things, like a move or a death in the family or a divorce or something, like that, and they have points attached to those things of the stress that causes you in, in life or loss of a job. Um, well, I mean, Judah has lost two sons, and then this whole thing, you know, with Joseph, it's just got to be lingering around in the background because they're seeing Jacob all the time. You know, if Jacob was gone, it'd be a different thing, I think, but they're just reminded probably all the time. So all that adding up, it's got to be, you know, a lot of stress. Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit more about Jacob here uh, shortly. It, you know, it's interesting at this point, uh, as he recounts the story uh, about their family, he says in verse 20, we have an older, we have an old father and he, there is a child of his old age, the youngest, his full brother is dead so that he alone is left of his mother and his father dotes on him, right? And so again, we're at that brink, not yet do the brothers understand who joseph is we know we're still getting that veil is still there that it, it's it, their eyes are still clouded to who joseph really is uh even up to this point and we were talking earlier uh one commentator I, I read down in verse 30 when it says i now if i come to your servant my father and the boy is not with us since his own life is so bound up with his when he sees that the boy is not with us, he will die and your servants will send the white head of your servant, our father, down to Sheol in grief. And the commentator is saying, you're basically going to kill my father <laughs> if you yeah. go follow through. And so it's almost like he's accusing Joseph of murder here, right? And so maybe, again, adding to the, the thought process that perhaps Judah sort of had enough, uh, because that'd be a very thin, tight rope to walk if you're, you know, trying to explain to, to the head man in charge there that uh, and, and basically accuse him of murder and uh, even imply that he would be complicit in the father's death uh, if he didn't change his actions. So, I mean, it's, it's a, like we said, it's a really powerful speech uh, for what Judah is, is doing. Maybe he thinks he has nothing to lose. He's going to stand up for Benjamin and, to be accused, you know, of stealing something from the second person in charge could bring death, I guess. And he's thinking, okay, well, you know, if I'm going out, I'm going to, I'm going to say what I think. And as Jimmy's pointing out, we talked about the the stress and the worry and all that, you know, it does affect the physical health. And we don't know how Jacob's doing. You get the impression as we'll read a little bit uh, in a little bit that, maybe his health isn't as good. And so all this trauma and stress and worry and toll uh, maybe has literally affected, affected his health. 
but uh, we get through that chapter, right? And uh, Judah has made his impassioned plea uh, to, to let Benjamin go and uh, bring back the father and, and that, that sort of thing. And so Joseph in chapter 45 said, it says he could no longer control himself before all his attendants and he cried out, have everyone withdraw. Uh, so there's no one else about Joseph and he sobs were loud that the Egyptians could hear and the news reached Pharaoh's palace. So the, the stoic Joseph, the one who's been pulling the strings, all of a sudden uh, he couldn't hold it back any yeah. longer. And the dams burst and there, there comes the tears. Next week uh, it's kind of, and we talked about this in the account of Joseph chapters 37 through 50, uh, Joseph weeps seven times, and in those seven times there, are, and we'll, we'll talk about it next week, but uh, I think there's a pattern, um, and so, you know, if this coming week we want to go back and remind ourselves of the times that Joseph weeps, and then the last time he weeps is chapter 50, but the, I think there's a pattern in that. Joseph is weeping, and he's weeping now. Mm -hmm. And, and it's kind of, I, I don't know about you, I, I sort of laughed a little bit when I, when I read this, verse 3, uh, he tells his brother, I am Joseph, is my father still well? But the brothers couldn't answer because they were dumbfounded uh, on account of him, right? I mean, you just, you just picture this shock and it's like, what? <laughs> Who are you? Yeah, they're terrified. Yeah. Uh, because what's he going to do now? And that's, that's. That's a good question. I mean, you, you think about trying to walk through the process of, of being a brother. If you can put yourself in the brother's shoes at all, which I may not be able to do, but but you thought this guy's been dead for 20 plus years. Yeah. Right? You've lived under that assumption. You've lived with the guilt of being complicit in his death. Uh, you have no expectation that he's alive whatsoever. Uh, and now he's revealed to being alive, and not only is he alive, but he is as powerful as Pharaoh in a land, the land of Egypt. And now he's just told them, I am Joseph. I mean, if they had any thought of what uh, divine working might have been going on, can you imagine what would be crossing their minds about, you know, the work of God at this time? I mean, they, there's absolutely, I don't think, any way they could have thought that Joseph would be this powerful man in Egypt. I mean, you know, last time I saw him, he's, he's sold into slavery. And that was, and I've read some people, you know, that say, well, they at least they didn't kill him. They didn't kill him directly. <laughs> they, they wanted to kill him indirectly. So the blood was not on their, their hands. And you don't survive being a slave like that in the ancient world. Right. Yeah. Here he, here he is now, second in command. And, you know, Jimmy making a comment here that, you know, at least death would have been an end. And, uh, yeah, so either the, the they lived with the uh, thought that they had killed him, or maybe they, did, they lived with the thought that they weren't sure they killed him. And maybe that, you know, even that was a little bit more nagging back there that, you know, what if he were still alive? Or what if he spent years with that Ishmaelite caravan as a slave? What, you know, and they don't know. I mean, I think it's fair to say they, they probably presumed he was dead, but that living with that trauma for all those years and that's that stress. I mean, and now, and now in a moment, in an instant for it to be uh, your brother standing there and all, all of that to be, um, uh, in some ways for not because it's, it was wrong, but to have lived with that and now to have the truth revealed. I mean, know. he's not going to be second in command in Egypt in their minds. Right. I, you know, I mean, that's, absolutely. there's no way. I mean, it's, uh, I watched a movie the other day and I thought they killed a bad guy. And then next thing, you know, he pops back up and I said, no way. He's, he's, they killed him. And, I mean, you can imagine that in real life that they did it. And now, they're standing before him. Yeah. Joseph's comments, though, uh, in verse five. Um, now, do not be distressed or reproach yourselves because you sold me hither. It was to save life that God sent me ahead of you. 
you know, one of the things that uh, we talked about, and I don't remember now in this section, I know we we're going to talk about it again, but this idea that uh, unlike Jacob, unlike Isaac, unlike Abraham uh, and others, we don't really have a, a, any recollection or recording, I should say, of, of God talking to Joseph directly, at least recorded, right? We don't know. The closest we've had so far is uh, the dreams. Joseph says God will interpret the dreams, but not really says, you know, that God spoke to him in some way. But yet he's able to say at this point, you know, that God sent me ahead of you to save life uh, and, and don't be distressed or reproach yourselves. I mean, that's, I, I, I appreciate that. And I, I'm, I know it to be true, but again, you know, as we just said, you've lived with something for 20 years and now your brother wants you to say, Hey, it's don't worry about it. <laughs> really? You're still a, almost Pharaoh. And this is a little bit different. I mean, he says, well, one thing before I forget in verse four, after he says, I, I'm Joseph and they're terrified. And then he said, come near to me. I, I beg you. And he uses a particle there of uh, entreaty. But the name of this whole Parsha is uh, by Yigash. And Nagash means come near. So Judah came near. And then here in verse four, Joseph, after he says, I'm Joseph, he said, come near. So Judah came near. And now he says to the brothers, come near. And then it says, and they came near. And that's, uh, that's the plural form of the name of the Parsha. They came near. And then he says again, I'm Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Wonder why he had to add that, because they knew <laughs> that they sold Joseph, their brother, in Egypt. But, all right, then you were saying that he says, God did, God, don't be angry that you sold me, because God sent me before you to preserve life. And then verse seven, God sent me before you to save you alive. It's not you that sent me here, but God. That's a little bit different from chapter 50, because chapter 50, he says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Here, he's, you know, don't be angry with yourselves. Don't be grieved. God sent me here. Yeah. I, it, and I guess, you know, with the passage of time, you could say, you know, it was, it was different. Maybe he just didn't record it here. But, um, I mean, what do you say to your brothers, right? I mean. You, they're now standing before you. Here's the guys that, you know, left you for dead. And what, and, you know, maybe you've jerked them around a little bit by back and forth, back and forth. I, I don't know what his motives necessarily were. Um, they don't seem to always be true motive. I mean, um, not true, but um, pure motives, you know, and we can talk about that, but uh but now but he's what there. human has completely pure motives. So, but he's standing before him there, you know, and, and what does he say to him? And he says, don't worry about it. God, God's been in charge. And, and again, I think it's one of those salient points that uh, it's easy to say, absolutely. God's in charge, right? I, this is what God meant. And, and we kind of read and move on, but, as we've said before, I think in this this class, uh, Joseph's not the main character here. Judah's not the main character here. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's not the main character here. God is, right? And and that's that's what we need to be thinking about, I believe. And and for Joseph to acknowledge this uh, is extremely uh, important. Uh, because it does summarize what God's intentions were, and that is to save lives. He's always wanted to be saved in life, uh, wants all men to be saved, all people to be saved. And so this is another opportunity for that, that message uh, to come through. But it is interesting, as you said, and you get to chapter 50, and it's like, well, you know, maybe, it's, maybe he has a little bit different take on it. But And in the Hebrew, in verse, in verse 8, uh, God is emphatic. God, God sent me. So it, it's made emphatic. Yeah. Uh, 
I don't know how he knows that or how he maybe is just a spiritual man that he has discerned that, but he can say, God sent me here. All right, well, uh, if there's not anything further on that, we can keep moving through the narrative here and uh, we can see that, you know, Joseph's gonna set up an opportunity for to bring the father back and the family down and uh, have some land in Goshen there where uh, they'll be able to uh, live and he'll provide for you. And of course, Joseph makes a, a point, make sure you tell my father about my high station in life, you know, my position that I hold and everything you've seen and bring him on down. Uh, well, I was re triggered my thought. I was going to say something. Um, yeah, I think about Joseph and uh, the, the, the idea that, you know, he, he sort of went back and forth with the brothers and, you know, we looked at it and sort of jerked him around and stuff. We kind of made out, at least perhaps I have and, and, and people I, I've talked to, you know, Joseph almost like the, the most second most perfect person in the world, right? Just some, just some short distance right behind Jesus. Everything about Joseph was great. You know, we, we talk about the stories of Joseph and it was all, all wonderful and he could do no wrong. And uh, even if it, if the rabbis, you know, kind of make the, you know, downplay a few things that could possibly be disparaging on Joseph's character. But yet he was a man just like we are. He was a human being. He had these emotions uh, and, and, we should recognize that we are emotional people and, you know, maybe he didn't act uh, purely toward his brothers. Maybe he wanted to show them, hey, who's in charge and that sort of thing. And it's still, it's not necessarily, I don't think, in contrast to acknowledging that God was uh, at work, but uh, I think there's that tension there. And I look at it and go, I'm glad we have these stories and I'm, I'm glad I can look at it somewhat critically because I want to know that even these great heroes of faith uh, perhaps struggled in their lives, right? And we know that they weren't perfect because I know I'm not. <laughs> uh, and God works in spite of, you yes. know, of them. God has this, and it's that, that uh, meta narrative and micro narrative. And um, yeah, I mean, you could question his motivation. I mean, some of it you might say, well, and, and I think pretty much it's my feelings that he's, he te he's testing them to see if they've changed because Benjamin's left and you don't know what they're going to do to him. Uh, but again, it sometimes seems like a little much. <laughs> you know, at the heart of, of this relationship between the brothers and Joseph uh you know, it's been quarrelsome. It's been obviously, uh, it seemed like on the, on the best of days, it was quarrelsome, much less getting to the point where you're going to sell them into slavery. Uh, and now you, Joseph's revealed himself to them and, uh, you know, he's wept and he's, he's given them lots of rations and uh, he's, he's going to do all these things and uh, he gave him a change of clothing. Uh, and he sent his father the following uh, gifts uh, and even in all this, there's still preference for Benjamin. And there is. And so at the very verse 24, do not be quarrelsome on the way. And it, it's like, this is what this whole family is. And you got to ask, you know, well, this is somehow they look at it and, and, and realize that, hey, just because Joseph in charge doesn't mean that all the acrimonious feelings and all the issues we've had are just suddenly, you know, disappearing. I think Joseph even acknowledges this. and and. And like you just said, he gave Benjamin more, right? So he's he's showing some par, uh, preferential treatment uh, to a particular brother. You know, he's elevating one brother over the other ten. And, and maybe the I mean the idea um, Jesus has had twelve apostles, but he was in 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 terms of closeness not close on an equal basis with all of them. There's the three, you know, that he's real close. Um, and maybe it's something like that going on. And then even in a family, um, cause this world is, you know, 
we struggle with sin. We struggle with all these things. And, and I'm not saying, you know, Jesus did that. He didn't. He's perfect. But with Joseph, he's closer to Benjamin. That's just the way it is. It does seem, though, that perhaps at this point in time, while there may still be some favoritism, we're all they're going to live with it. Right. I mean, they've, they've, yeah. they're sort of reconciled to it. Uh, I think they're going to be happy that, you know, Joseph is actually alive and they're going to find, you know, uh, some good benefits out of that when they, they all move to Goshen and, and set up a shepherd. They're alive because he's alive. <laughs> right. And so, I mean, they can't overlook that. Uh, but you don't seem to have the animosity. You know, you still, you know, you got some quarreling and stuff, but there is some reconciliation that, uh, hey, maybe – God has been at work and things are going to work out the way they should, should work out. That verse about don't quarrel on the way where, uh, where is that? It's in verse 24, chapter 25. Um, yeah. Um, that word means um, to be agitated and I mean, it probably means don't quarrel with each other, but the rabbi suggests some other interpretations. Um, one is that um, they don't become impatient in their journey and get lost and don't get back home and then come back, or they also try to travel too quickly, something like that. Uh, and some suggest, and, and I'm not saying all these are equal in, in you know, what they might be, but. And some suggest don't uh, don't fear robbers because they're carrying a lot of stuff back down to Canaan. So, uh, in other words, what I'm saying is it's not a hundred percent certain that Joseph says, "Oh yeah, I'm Joseph. Good to see you and everything." And go back and go get our father and bring everybody down here, and and y'all don't get into a fight on the way back. It's not a hundred hundred percent certain he's saying that. He probably is, but. Well, they do have a reputation. Yeah. 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 They have a past. Well, they get home and they tell daddy, hey, you won't believe it. Joseph's alive and he's in charge of all Egypt. And and uh, Jacob, you know, it says his heart went numb for he did not believe them. Now, here's 10 of your boys coming back. I got 11. And, uh, and they're basically telling him Joseph's alive. And he's in charge, and yet they have, a, as we just said, a reputation. And and Jacob says, I, I, I don't believe you. Or, you know, at least that was what's reported of him. And I was thinking this today. It doesn't appear they told him all what happened about he mm -hmm. sold into slavery, that they're part of it. So did he did they ever tell him that? I don't I don't see anywhere in the text where they say, okay, here's how it all worked out. They just came back. You're not going to believe this guy that we met in Egypt. That's Joseph. Yeah. You know, and I don't know. Well, I think we, 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 we tend to compartmentalize certain things and we still, you know, being completely vulnerable and open uh, while that's the best way uh, if you've done things, uh, it can be difficult to be completely open and because you're fear, you fear the ramifications and what might come from that. Uh, so at least they're willing to say, Hey, Joseph's alive and, uh, we're excited about that. He's in charge. And, uh, and Jacob finally says, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to go down and see for myself before I die. And that really sets up the next chapter, you know, pretty well. Uh, with the concern that, uh, you know, uh, Isaac was told and uh, Jacob surely knows, hey, I don't want you going down to Egypt. That's not the promised land. Uh, you got to stay. This is the this is the land right here. And so now, uh, you know, Jacob's got to make this journey down to Egypt and he's going to be living there uh, for some extended period of time. And uh, I guess that's a fair question to ask. Did that cross Jacob's mind and how he might have thought about that and uh, how he might have considered what God was telling him or, or, or how God would perceive that, I should say. I mean, you have there, as the chapter opens, 
he set out on his journey, Israel set out on his journey with all that he had. So taking everything, but he doesn't go to Egypt. He goes to Beersheba and, and he offers sacrifices there to God, uh, the God of his father, Isaac. Um, maybe there was an idea in the back of his mind, you know, should I go to Egypt? Um, and, and what's interesting also is after that episode, so in verse one, Israel took, sat out on his journey with all that he had, came to Beersheba. Verse five, and Jacob rose up, got up from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried Jacob, their father, and their little ones, their wives, and everybody, and they go to Pharaoh. So is this a side trip, or did everybody go? And he said, you guys stay here. I got to go. I got to go over here and do something. And then they come get him. So, and I don't know how feeble he is. Yeah, it, it, but he's there. And then this is the only time in the the narrative of Joseph, this third chapters 37 to 50, where we actually have God talking and, uh, yeah. and, and, and God about to say something that's recorded for us uh, in the scripture. And, uh, you know, he's about to tell, tell Jacob, uh, I am, I am God, the God of your father, fear not to go down to Egypt for I will make you there into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt and I myself will also bring you back and Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. That's, that's kind of unique phrasing there. It says I myself, right? Yeah, it's emphatic uh, in, in the Hebrew and, um, in Hebrew, just a little bit in Hebrew, when you have a verb, the subject is in the verb form itself. So you don't you don't need a subject or a pronoun is in the verb form itself. Like uh, if you say I said something, it's just one word. I said the form of the verb. The pronoun is in there. When you have a pronoun in addition to that, that's emphasizing that pronoun. I. And it's usually translated something like if I myself or he himself did that. Like uh, when, and when God confronts Adam and uh, Adam says, uh, the woman you gave to me, she, and he emphasizes the she, she gave me to eat. And so he's, he's really emphasizing she did it. But here God says, I, my, I will be with you. I myself will be with you. And in verse four, I mean, he's going to bring the nation back up out of Egypt, but the you there, I will surely bring you up again. The you is singular. And so he's saying to Jacob, I will bring you up from Egypt again. What he's saying, I think, is that you, 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 uh, Joseph will outlive you. You don't have to worry that Joseph's going to die before you. You're going to die before Joseph, but I'll bring your body up. You won't be buried in Egypt because Egypt's not the promised land. Mm -hmm. and, and Joseph has that same faith as well. You remember he, when he, he says, don't uh, you bury me in the promised land and it right. carries bones around. So, so yeah, it's a wonderful, it's re, it's repeating that promise again. Yeah. It was sometimes we get the impression of, uh, that the promise was said once and done, right? Uh, but it is repeated over and over again. Some, you know, not always using the same words, but uh, the meaning's usually always clear. And I think that's, uh, we need to hear that. Uh, we need to hear the message and the promises of God uh, throughout our lives, various times in our lives. Yes, of course. The, the sacrifices he's in verse one, it says he offered sacrifices or he sacrificed sacrifices. And that exact phrase is found only one other place in Genesis in chapter 31, verse 54. And it's Jacob doing it there. But all the other patriarchs offer whole burnt offerings, Olaf. And a whole burnt offering is a whole burnt offering and there's nothing left. It's completely burned up. This is a, um, 
a, a zavah. It's a sacrifice. And uh, most of the rabbis say that this is like a peace offering, but part of it's offered to God and then part of it's eaten. And just like, you know, you have a bunch of food, there's joy in sharing that food with others. And so it's, it's, the rabbis say that this is a family offering in a sense, and it's related to a peace offering. And so, and, and I, they make a big deal. I don't know whether it's right, but they make a big deal that Jacob at this point now can offer a peace offering because Joseph's alive. He's going down to Egypt. There's relative peace. Shalom. Well, we've, you, I know you'll remember we've talked about that idea of chaos and peace, chaos yeah. and peace. Yeah. Uh, it, it'd be nice to think that this was, uh, uh, that, that Jacob had this in mind, that truly this was a peace offering, that he's not only grateful and thankful for uh, what he has now learned about Joseph and, and what's going on, but that uh, whatever turmoil, whatever chaos, whatever stress, has been taking place in his life perhaps he now as in his old age is at peace truly maybe maybe even for the first time uh at peace because yeah. if you think about his life going back to to esau and even before that i mean it you don't you don't get a picture i'd have to think but you remind me i don't get a picture of, of jacob really being uh at peace throughout any of his life well he tells pharaoh when he's honored he says Pharaoh says, how old are you? And he says, I'm 130. And he describes his life as few and evil. His days as few and evil. Yeah. Evil <laughs> or bad. <laughs> you know, it's it's the word. You think you put that on his tombstone? <laughs> yeah. 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 Here lies Jacob. Long, short <laughs> days and all evil. Yep. Yeah. Well, um, The rest of the, the chapter of 46, uh, at least most of it, uh, it is a genealogy that, uh, unless anybody wants to discuss it, want to kind of kind of move on, it, it's certainly worth reading. And uh, you, you, you get, uh, it lays out how they come up with the idea that there were 70 persons who went down to Egypt and uh, whatever that number is. And there's obviously some discussion about the number, but uh, you see that it is a small number. And by the time they leave uh, Egypt, what that number has grown to uh, really is a testament to God's blessing of this nation uh, and, and, and a precursor for what's to come when they finally get back to the, to the promised land. And as Exodus opens up, it talks about, it just piles one verb right on another to talk about, I mean, how, they, how many verbs do you have to have that they multiplied? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just like one right on top of the other that they multiplied and God is involved in all that. So 70 or, you know, 75 or roughly whatever. I think Stephen in his sermon in Acts 7 has 75. I may be wrong on that. The Septuagint has uh, one of those 70 or 75. I don't know. But anyway, it depends on, I guess, who you count and with how you view numerals. But um, to go from that, you're right, to this huge multitude and how that happened. Well, it happened because God is the one who's working all this. And it works in surprise. He works in surprising ways because then there's a Pharaoh that didn't appreciate Joseph. And you think, well, you know, what's going to happen now? Yeah. So that, that account, that's, that's for Exodus. <laughs> well, beginning of verse 28, in those last, you know, four or five verses there in this this chapter, you finally have Joseph and Jacob meeting again after this long absence. And uh, I think it's interesting the, the, the dichotomy here between Joseph, who now sees his father and uh, who weeps again, right? And so uh, embraces around the neck. He wept on his neck a good while. So, you know, he's crying for some period of time. But yet, uh, you don't have recording that Jacob shed any tears over this. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's, that's kind of interesting, right? I mean, what, I'm sure there can be a couple of reasons, but. Um, strange. Yeah. I mean, it might be even strange just to say, why even record the fact that Jacob, I mean, that Joseph cried for a good long while when Jacob didn't cry at all. Why? Again, we've talked about, you know, when you 
you only have a limited number of words, so to speak, and you choose to record a certain thing, there, there should be some significance to it. Uh, and is there significance here? And uh, I know that the rabbis have some idea and various uh, thoughts about why Jacob didn't cry when Joseph did. Yeah, let, let me read you a quote from uh, Rabbi Hirsch in a minute. But uh, it's almost like Joseph is just weeping and weeping for a long you know, while, and Jacob's standing there waiting you know, till it's over because verse 30 in Israel says to Joseph, now let me die since I've seen your face for your life. I mean, <laughs> he, how long did he weep? You know, it's just over and over and over. And then Jacob says, all right, uh, let me die because uh, I've seen your face. But let me read you this quote from Rabbi Hurst. He says, Jacob had ceased to weep long ago, but Joseph still wept. And these little details reflect a profound truth. Through all the years of Joseph's absence, Jacob had led a dull, monotonous life, weeping for Joseph. All his emotions had been spent in mourning Joseph. Joseph's life, in the meantime, had been a most eventful one. As a result, Joseph had had no time to surrender so completely to the pain of separation from his father. He was totally absorbed in the immediate present. But now he felt the impact of this separation and relived the 20 years that had passed. So I don't know if there's anything to that or not, but uh, it's, it's interesting because yeah. you, I mean, he wept a long time and then Israel says, all right, let me die. <laughs> well, thankfully he doesn't die at that moment. In fact, uh, Joseph has a chance to present him uh, and the family to to Pharaoh himself, uh, as you, we get into chapter 47. This is our last chapter for the Parsha, um, this week's Parsha. And uh, interesting, again, we talked about the choice of words. And when Pharaoh asked the brothers, what's your occupation? They replied that they're shepherds and they've come to sojourn in this land. I know we talked before about uh, sojourning really implying that you know, we're not going to be permanent residents here. Uh, we could be here a while and they tend, they end up being there a while, but in their mind, it is just a, a, um, a short period of time. And then they're going back to what they know is, uh, and call their own home, right? I mean, Egypt's not the promised land. And in scripture, usually when people go down to Egypt, you know, bad things happen. Uh, Egypt is going to preserve them, but they're not there. Egypt, the promised land hasn't changed from Canaan to Egypt. And um, even the fact that, you know, they're, they're in Goshen. And I guess the idea is they're kind of separate from Egyptian religion and society. Um, and also Joseph says, when the Pharaoh asks, what's your work? You tell him you're a shepherd. And then we learned that the Egyptians, you know, uh, shepherds are an abomination to Egyptians. It's, that's the same word that says that various sins are abomination to God. So what that does, it separates them from Egyptian culture and Egyptian life. Somehow Joseph has remained in the middle of all that, but he's remained faithful or separate. Yeah, we talked about that last week, and it's not, you know, he can't eat with the, uh, yeah. his brothers. How, you know, what does that mean himself? And, yeah, it, it is a strange, you know, dichotomy and, and setup for Joseph himself. He certainly is walking that, that tightrope, and apparently and, he's able to do it okay. And does this, because, I mean, what? who is Joseph? Is he an Egyptian? He, well, we know he's a Hebrew, but is he an Egyptian? If he's Egyptian, so his brothers are up there in Goshen, and he comes there to meet them and everything, is he able to eat with them, or is that going to put, you know, his Egyptian life in jeopardy, you know, over here? And does he go back down to, um, I always forget, I think lower Egypt's in the, in the top part, upper in the yeah. lower. Uh, does he go back down to wherever he is, and, you know, from Goshen? But one thing that a lot of the commentators mention is that Goshen does separate them from Egyptian influence in some way.
But you're right, they say we're just here to sojourn. Now, <clears throat> if you look at the end of the Parsha, the very last verse, verse 27 of uh, 30, uh, 47. Is that right? Yes. I'm looking at Roman numerals here, and I don't think I was taught adequately <laughs> that. But uh, verse 27 says, after that whole thing of Joseph buying all the land and everything, Israel dwelled in the land of Egypt and the land of Goshen, and they acquired possessions and they were fruitful and they multiplied. <clears throat> the rabbis say that sounds a little bit more than sojourning. <laughs> it right. sounds like they're starting to um, be at home. Well, when Jacob is talks to Pharaoh, of course, earlier it says, "My years." The years of my sojourn are 130. So, I mean, that's a little bit more than just a walk in the park yeah. <laughs> itself. Uh, but I, I think it's more of a mindset, right? Really, you know, and I it's it, try not to make, you know, force an analogy here, but, you know, if we think that our citizenship really is uh, whatever heaven will be, then whether we're here for five years or, 50 years or 150 years, uh, it's a it's a short journey, right? Well, to something yeah. in comparison to what you know will be. Uh, but I think that's the temptation for us too, is to, you know, if go, you know, I think we see that with, and again, not foreshadowing too much if we get to the Exodus, that's that was Egyptians' problem. They didn't see it, Canaan as their as their home. They wanted to go back to where they understood they had those possessions and you know. Yeah. Uh, what home was right they when things got rough they wanted to go back to to what they'd been comfortable with um, yeah yeah in the wilderness from, home turned into and egypt was home yeah well jacob leaves and is in, i want to point this out before our time is up uh i, I did think it was interesting in verse 10 jacob then bade fair bade pharaoh farewell and left pharaoh's presence uh in one of the commentaries i read said that the phrase bade farewell could be translated blessed and from that continues the idea that all these people uh, particularly pharaohs uh, egyptians who come in contact with god's chosen people here uh, end up being blessed yeah you know, it's, even, the, it's the literal word for blessed barak yeah and uh verse seven when how you have that translated Joseph then brought his father Jacob and presented him to Pharaoh, and Jacob greeted Pharaoh. Okay, so they have greeted there, and then in verse 10, they have bade farewell. Yeah. Uh, both That's the same word in both places. It's the word blessed. And so it is the idea, I think, you know, back in chapter 12 of Genesis, when Abraham's called, um, you'll be a blessing to all people. And so... Some people think, and I had worked out the chronology of this, that uh, when it talks about the, uh, like the, when Joseph's buying up all the land, the flocks and everything, the end of this, and it says in the second year they came, some think that that's, that's going back, that's like a, like a movie you're going back and you're looking at, so there's the second year of the famine. Others think that it, 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 it's the second year to go, I, I don't remember how exactly how to explain it all, but they the bottom line is they think when Jacob came to some rabbis think when Jacob came to Egypt that there was it supposed to be seven years of fam, famine yeah. that there was not that that was cut short because Jacob came and that that blessed because he blessed Egypt in that sense. Again, I don't I don't know all that. I haven't worked out the chronology. Well, it seems to be a, a, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I'd be interested to see that, but I get the impression from the, what follows in that text. And we'll, I guess we'll end on this because our time's about running out that uh, each season, the Egyptians have to go back to uh, Joseph and basically have to sell more of what they own to eventually, as the text sort of says, enslave themselves or whether it's, 
truly as slaves or indentured servitude or something, but, you know, they're having to go back to Joseph every year and give up more of who they are to the point that uh, it says that, you know, Joseph basically bought everything in the land for Pharaoh. And now Pharaoh almost literally owns it all, including the people. Like Monopoly. And, yeah. And, and I think that's kind of interesting. It's like, again, is that, is that right? That they should sell themselves and that Joseph would accept them as some type of, 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 in, to put it on the milder side, indentured servitude, uh, because I mean, his own people will obviously in, end up enslaved themselves. Uh, I don't know. I don't know whether we can, um, uh, whether we can condemn Joseph in this or whether we can justify Joseph in this, uh, you know, you get to the point where, so on the one hand, Jacob and his brother and Joseph's brothers and that whole family are blessed and they continue as we just read in, in verse uh, 34 or verse, excuse me, uh, in, in, yeah, verse 27 of that, of the chapter 47, they were fertile and increased greatly, right? While on the other hand, <laughs> the citizens of that country, so the Egyptians, uh, become enslaved to, in yeah. their own country. Yeah. So it's kind of you set. I can, you can see where you're setting up this. What's soon going to be uh, a major conflict. Yeah. Now, yeah. one thing that's interesting, and I don't know if this will add to anything, but verse 17, they brought their cattle to Joseph. Joseph gave them bread in exchange for the horses and for the flocks and the herds and donkeys, and he fed them with bread in exchange for the cattle for that year. The word fed there is um, a word that means um, lead, it's a shepherd word. It means to lead to a quiet place where the mm -hmm. shepherd leads the sheep to, the, to a, a, a quiet place, a place of rest. And so it's strange that you have a verb there used of Joseph in that, and this is in relation to the Egyptians. So I don't know if that would change everything, whether he's just this hard government official buying up everything or whether he it's, it's just the nature of the way this thing turned out. Yeah. And he's trying to show compassion. I don't know. Well, in some ways he did sort of shepherd everybody through this great family. Yeah. yeah. So okay. without him, uh, <coughs> they would have been hurting. Yep. Yeah. So they were. Well, all right. Well, that ends our time. Uh, an hour has gone by and we've gotten through the Parsha and short of anybody uh, have any questions or comments they want to add, we'll, we'll wrap this up. Feel free. <laughs> uh, we're going to, uh, I'm going to ask Aaron. Aaron is a brother and friend of, mine from uh, Hawaii. He's in the mainland now uh, for Christmas, but he's uh, he's in Hawaii. And we're going to ask him to leave a closing prayer in just a moment. Does anybody have anything you want to say or type? You, you don't have to type it, just say it. <laughs> okay, well. I'm sure that was for my benefit, and thank you, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> mine too. It takes time to type, doesn't it? Aaron, good to meet you, brother. Same here, bro. Same here. Uh, well, again, we appreciate everybody being with us. And uh, Chris, next week's the last portion in Genesis, isn't it? It is. Okay. And if you haven't seen, and I'll, I'll email out the thing, but uh, we're going to continue uh, without a break into Exodus and uh, I'll email that schedule. And what are there, 10 Parshas, I think, in Exodus? For 10, and we'll start uh, on January 11th, which should be that uh, Monday night, uh, January 11th. And then uh, we'll end on uh, March 15th, uh, which will, again, is that Monday night. So, so next week's the 4th. And then we'll just begin on 11th with Exodus. Yep. So hope that you can continue to, to join us. Uh, we are, are encouraged that you're here. And again, I know it takes time uh, to 
to do this, but we we're encouraged by you being here and for any, any comments, questions you have, uh, and continue to pray for the class. Any, anything anybody wants to say? Okay, Aaron, we're going to ask you if you lead us in closing prayer, please. All righty, let us pray. Dearly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to share again a portion of your word, Lord, and uh, study more deeply uh, the book of Genesis, Lord, and uh, the last Parsha uh, of that book, Lord. We ask that um, the things that we've, we've read, we've researched, we've discussed on um, this evening, Lord, that we uh, look at those things, uh, look at those truths, Lord, um, and learn from them, Lord. Uh, as it's written, Lord, uh, uh, the, the book was, uh, was written for our learning. Uh, we ask that uh, we all, um, all meditate um, on these things, Lord, and uh, we cultivate a, a list of uh, questions and uh, things that uh, we desire to uh, learn and, and dig deeper uh, on our next meeting, Lord. We ask that you uh, take us uh, to our uh, places of abode um, throughout the week, Lord, um, in our comings and goings, Lord, keep us safe, Lord, uh, in this uh, time and season um, of the pandemic, Lord. Bring us back uh, together virtually, Lord, at the next point in time, Lord, so that we might study another portion of your word. This we ask in your holy and precious Son, Jesus Christ's name, we do pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Aaron. All right. All right. Thank, thank, you. thank you, everybody. Have a good rest of the week. See you later.